Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated now for the readings. First reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our inequities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord.
second reading is in the letter to the Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. 
Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked, Whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And he replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. I am not to drink the cup. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, No, I'm not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. And the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus in the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, No, I'm not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your own law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, 
Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests you've handed over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So, you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against this man, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him in the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus went out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they all shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters and again asked the Jews, Where are you from? Asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. <clears throat> Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have, power, have the power to release you or the power to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate continued to try and release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabata. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this transcription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. 
And then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I'm king of the Jews. Pilate answered, I've written what I've written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. And so they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture said, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was the day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and their bodies removed. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture. They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
On this night, every year, we hear the story of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. We hear the crowd's eager, bloodthirsty demand for violence. Year after year after year, it never changes. Why do we do it? The matter is done. Jesus was born, he died, and he was raised thousands of years ago. None of those people are alive anymore. And we now believe in everything that Jesus was trying to get everyone way back then to believe in. We weren't there. We weren't part of the crowd, part of the Roman army, weren't Jesus' disciples who deserted him. We played no part in any of this. So what does it have to do with us? Why do we need to bear witness year after year to sins we ourselves did not commit? Well, there are too many good reasons to count. So tonight I will just frame the answer within Jesus' own words from the Gospel of Matthew. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Just because Jesus' crucifixion happened 2,000 years ago, It doesn't mean that we escape culpability. Because we believe that Christ is within each and every one of God's created beings. Just as we did or did not do it to the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. So we did it to him. We continue to hang bodies on the cross. Black bodies, brown bodies, trans bodies, bodies of Palestinians, Israelis, Ukrainians, Africans. On a smaller, maybe more intimate scale, we hang bodies of bullied children and adults, of the neglected or the forgotten, of those who don't fit into what society deems as normal. Crucified bodies litter the landscape of our lives. And we spend our days, most of us, most of them, looking away, pretending that we can't see those crucified bodies, pretending that we didn't play a part, however small. Often we, I, often I, look away because I don't know what to do about it. I have no solution to the problem, and looking too closely feels like drowning slowly with no lifeline in sight. And how does it help me or all of us if we die together? Well, that is what Good Friday is for. On Good Friday, there is no solution. There is no task to do when you walk out of these doors. There's no fix to the problem. Jesus is gone. He is not here. And on this day, thousands of years ago, that is all that was known. And that is all that we know. So, for just one day out of the year, our only job is to look. To look at those crucified bodies piling miles high on our earth and wail in agony like Mary did while her son died on the cross. 
our job on this one day is to see in Jesus' death the deaths of all of the brutalized children of God who followed after him to feel their desolation, die with them, and wait in desperate hope for the resurrection that we trust and know will come. We just don't get to see it quite yet. For all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Susan, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. By whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Them. For Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, tenderly we pray in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, and for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and the bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger. A God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. The comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their affliction. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who've never heard the words of salvation, for those who've lost their faith, for those hardened by sin and indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, and for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience.
creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.